All right, now that we're all here, I figured I'd start off with uh, with some some pictures. Or screen one, screen two. There we go. All right, so we got. I'm. I have a. I have a page in the OneNote that I called FSAE Money Shots, where I just dump Instagram links of teams that I'm kind of stalking. Um, how do I move this far? Oh, there we go. All right, bet. Um. Let's see, these guys I just found, not too much interesting here, except they have all their, they have their tires in plastic wrap. They're, the rear of their car looks super, I don't know, it looks kind of janky, to be honest, even though you see that heavenly Stuttgart name down there. Their HVD is on the back, like it's towards the top of the picture, mm -hmm. which is in interesting. Because if we don't have aero, then we could probably do something like that. And it looks like they have either carbon wrapped or carbon suspension, which Wait, is why do they have a diffuser if they don't have aero? Um, it helps. Uh, even if you run under tray only, um, you usually get usually with FSAE cars, your under tray produces the most amount of downforce. Okay. So there are cars that do just run under tray only. Um, so that mm -hmm. happens. But I also don't know enough about aero to tell you. If Whatever's happening in that back half is really doing a whole lot. Um, this picture was pretty cool, even though you can't really see it that well or zoom in that easily. But this part over here was interesting because I was like, huh, you get a little glimpse of their, of their, um, what do you call it? Their enclosure. system, their enclosure, how they're like putting all their batteries in there and stuff. Or it's pretty similar to us. So, I don't know. Maybe I'll hit them up and be like, hey, what did you do about having your batteries too low? Uh, this was also cool. In case you haven't noticed, I kind of like Western's cars a lot. They have some cool stuff. They sound really good, too. This is looks pretty like, wild. That's like what our top thing is, right? The hump? Yeah, yeah. But this this looks pretty wild. It's like white PCBs, plus they're super clean. They got that whole like three-dimensional design and layout, and I'm like the hell they did amazing packing that's packing. and i'm like that's... when i see our electrical captain has been hard at work and i'm like damn they're <laughs> oh, oh boy, <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> moving on <laughs> hey you're cool. chef spark now preston so you know get hey with it. hey hey technically derek was chef spark last year oh boy derek oh uh, yeah um let's see this was cool just because you know it's one of those like breakdowns see a wiring harness this is an ic car because they got an exhaust you can see the engine and all that all that jazz uh this one another back picture of the hvd rear mounted radiators with googly eyes <laughs> why not yeah sick looking steering wheel looks way too complicated but like looks sick. they're probably good enough i'm telling you preston we need a lizard grip, grip sponsorship also huge one over here diy battery pack they don't need to ship it out because they have a sunstone spot welder these are the closest you can get to affordable but still like industry standard uh spot welders don't those cost like five thousand dollars for the whole setup because you'll know you notice that um over here you've got the actual spot welder and this is just like the extra part you get for spot welding 18650s so why didn't we buy one of those with all the money that we had first year? see that's the question because we bought a grid simulator yeah but we don't have five grand to put on this which hurts because this would be so good for making our battery pack like holy crap um another picture you know so we're not going to mail it out to california anymore or that's so I don't know. All of all of that is on hold. I think I left him e hanging on his last email where he was basically like, we've shut down. Is your competition still going on? And I saw that like a month later and I was like, whoa. So we, we might have to come back to that, but there's still a lot of stuff that we should probably go back over and make sure we're doing right. Um, everything's like properly rules compliant before we ship it out. Because we were definitely hitting a point where we're just like getting really rushed and a lot of things were sliding. Important thing here, 
make sure your hair is tied back if you have long hair. Don't be like that one horror story of that girl that got sucked into a lathe. Hey, what? Um, anytime we're talking about shop safety, um, there's al- someone always brings up the, the, that one story about a girl who did, had her hair down and she was working on a lathe and got sucked in. Because the lathe is definitely more dangerous than a mill because with the mill it's kind of like a drill where like you're only your bits the spinning part but in the lathe you chuck your part and your whole part's spinning so what happened to her is her hair is her head okay <laughs> i have no idea it's one of those stories that's just been passed down it's like yeah. one of those stories that scare you away from ever using it but it was probably <laughs> true oh and this last one is just my like end game for designing like you can use SolidWorks Electrical. I have a tab in the in another OneNote page um, where I started exploring SolidWorks Electrical, but I kind of left that a few weeks ago and haven't really gone back to it. But man, Deutsch Autosport connectors are so nice, but they're so expensive. Anyways, um, let's see what we're we gonna do today. Um, so last time. We went over the HV enclosure board. Um, I will probably like edit that video and put it up later, but feel free to scroll through this whole thing. It's tried to put together and be as, what do you call it? Like as thorough as possible. And especially for most of the people who haven't taken like started who have just starting like taking all the ee classes because 140 and 150 eat up your first year in the major um yeah like i spent a lot of time on <laughs> like explaining voltage dividers but it was interesting i learned some things too let's see what's pre-charging why do we need it um well so if we start by looking at our tractor system as a whole we've got are like the main parts of it are the battery, the inverter, and the motor. And what your battery does is it's your energy source, provides you with a DC output current. Your inverter takes that and converts it to three phase AC, which is how we run our motor. Now, I remember getting grilled by some random professor when we were asking about a spot welder who, who he was like, do you know why you guys use an AC motor instead of a DC motor? And I think it boiled down to uh, it's more efficient. But I don't know. Uh, I haven't taken the electric machines class, and that shit gets pretty complicated. Um, right. So we've got our battery, inverter, motor. Why do we need a precharge circuit? Oh, man, dude, they spell it all out. It's so good. <laughs> um, so long story short, there are a bunch of capacitors in your um, in the inverter, and when you connect your battery to all those capacitors, then you go from zero volts all the way up to four hundred volts in like you know the blink of an eye. So what happens then is you remember you might have studied you probably haven't studied like RC you know RC circuits. I think you do them in physics, but you, did, you really only do them in 205 and stuff. Yeah. But basically, if you, you know, if you go from zero volts to 400 volts on those capacitors in there, then they're not going to like that. They're going to blow up because capacitors oppose, um, what do you call it? They oppose instantaneous change in voltage. So remember our relationships between voltage resistance and current so if you have a huge jump in voltage then you'll see a huge jump in current and you'll probably melt some stuff blow some capacitors and boom your inverter is toast so we need to somehow limit this current by like sort of gradually turning up the voltage um when i say gradual it's still like three seconds but that's a far cry from like less than half a second like instantaneous because you know speed of light electrons all that garbage um so what is our pre-charge circuit gonna do well instead of connecting the inverter directly to the battery initially 
we will connect it to a through a we'll add a resistor in series first. And that basically solves our problem where it changes it changes the time constant if you do the calculations for the circuit just enough so that it you'll see your voltage go up from zero to four hundred in a few seconds as opposed to instantaneously. So what are we gonna do? How do we how do you how do you just add a resistor in series? You can't go in there and just pull a wire out and plop it in. That's where relays come in handy. Um, relays are electromechanical switches. Basically, instead of operating a switch like manually with your hand, you apply voltage at two of the terminals and then it, it closes the switch. So it's an electrically controlled mechanical switch. You use them in a ton of applications. In most like small electronics, relays are not used. They're usually replaced with transistors, but you'll still see relays in your cars. Um, you know, in your fuse panel box and all that good stuff. Um, right. So what are design procedure? Yeah. What's required for this circuit? Well, you need a resistor, right? That you're going to add in series, you know, between your battery and your inverter. And you need a relay. And well, it says connectors, but that's all like logistical stuff. Now, you might also think, hey, it might be a good idea to add a fuse in. It's like, yeah, that would be a pretty good idea. But FSAE is like, nah, no fuse on the pre-charge circuit. So no fuse there. Do we know why it's not allowed? Um, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, I don't know why they don't allow it because the current that you see um, across the precharge or through the precharge resistor is like really, really low. It's like half an amp or like one amp or something like that, which I guess is kind of high in some some applications, but you know. Compared to full power, it's like trivially low. So, pre what's the point of the, what? Like our pre-charge resistor um, has to. All right. Well, hold up. Cool. So, pre-charge circuit has to charge up our inverter in a certain period of time. And there are two ways that we can do this. We can either time it where you do the calculations and you choose your resistor value so that you, let's see, so that you, let's see, where am I going? I'm going back to the PowerPoint. They explain all of this. I, I really should organize this better. Okay, so our pre-charge resistor needs to dissipate a lot of power. That's why we can't use a normal, like little Arduino type resistor, like resistor. Oh, oh. Like you might be thinking of one of these, but these are usually rated for an eighth of a watt, quarter of a watt. You'll see big ones that can do like half a watt. But how do you, how do you uh, calculate power again? Anyone trying to remind me? Piv. Oh, yeah, dog, it's piv. So if you think about our V, what's our V? 400. V, let's like say, all right, like an amp. That's still 400 watts. You're like, what the hell? All right, so 400 watt resistor. And what do you get? You get things that look like this. I don't even think these look like resistors. You're like, they're just giant hunks of aluminum. It's like, yeah, that makes sense because um, the resistance the resistor is going to heat up a shit ton, so you want to you want a lot of aluminum on that to dissipate all that heat. But if you're ever looking for something, some sort of load that's like high power, then you'll probably need one of these. They're called wire round resistors. Um, so, you know, the thing is, over here they say that it needs like your pre-charge sequence. So your time to go from zero to four hundred needs to be completed within three seconds. But there's actually a setting in the inverter that you can set so that you don't have to abide by that. But anyways, let's say, all right, now we get Y 
we need to add a resistor in series for, and the point of pre-charging. Do any of you guys have any questions? This was terribly done by me because everything else I've explained a ton, but for some reason I haven't really had to talk about this in a long time. We good? Yeah. Cool. Isaac, Jonah, we good? Yeah. All right. Keep going. So um, if you're ever confused about what we need to do, then this picture over here is like, that's basically it. That takes care of most of like visualization wise. Cool. Sizing the resistor. Oh man, this is where we get to do some math even though you don't need to derive this equation like you do in your classes, just steal it from the internet. <laughs> um, so if we're talking about this very, very simple circuit, um, this represents our system with a resistor and a capacitor in series. Uh, how do we, let's think about our unknowns. We know our voltage, uh, our resistance is unknown and we know our capacitance. How do we know our capacitance? They tell you in the data sheet. Um, boom, stolen from the data sheet. PM 150DX, 880 microfarads. Cool, now we got our C. How do we calculate our time constant? Well, time constant is equal to R times C. So what do we got? We got VC, VS. So you do some algebra over here, right? And once you get to, yeah, they, okay, yeah, they describe right here. Cool. Time taken for an RC circuit to charge its capacitor to 63.2%, one minus one over E. That's basically taken from getting this T over here. You're Is solving there a for reason T. that it needs to be 63.2%? Um, no. But since this is the equation that you're working with, then when you solve like when you solve the differential equation, this is what you end up with. And oh, maybe I should actually do the math out for this. Okay, I'll have to add a note for that where I should do this math and explain this a I little mean, better. So, okay, I, I understand why it's sixty-three point two. Now, because that, okay, 63.2 is just one minus one over okay. E, which means time is RC. Okay, I, yep. I, now I got it. Yep, cool. Actually, you could work that out from the units that your time constant is RC, right? Yeah. Um, oh, I forget. Hold up. What are the units of farads? Uh, units. Farads are, oh, yeah, no. If you convert them all to SI base units, then when you multiply R times C, you'll end up with a, you'll end up with T. Yep. Yep. Cool. So what do they tell us? All right, we're going, we, okay. So if the RC time constant, if we, if you get this value and you plug it into T here, that will give you what your VC is. So that'll take, that'll give you your voltage or that time is what's required for the voltage across your capacitor to get up to 63.2%. All right, so now that we know that, we need to figure out how do we get it up to, how much time does it take to get past 90%? Because that's what's in rules, right? Now over here, I think they take a thing of 95%, but basically they make a table here, which you can do similarly, where you start with your time constant and you're like, all right, so if at one RC, we get to 63.2%, then we'll try two. Two times RC, that gets us to 86.5%, almost there. Three times RC, 95%. Now, you could do four times the time constant, but I don't think that should matter too much. You can get away with the minimum, as we always do. Um, now, wow, what do you know? A lot of times you can do the calculations on your own and you should do them to compare them to what you're told in the data sheet. So 
Um, they tell you in the data sheet, which I also have in the Google Drive, but I'll probably move it to a more accessible location. They tell you in the data sheet that your internal capacitance is 880 microfarads and the maximum precharge resistor is 600 ohms. All right, so that's different. Our maximum DC bus voltage is actually 400 volts, 400 and like one or two volts. Internal capacitance values, that, all right. So our time constant is half a second. That's still pretty sick, you know? So three times the time constant is 1.5 seconds. So you think about like, oh, pre-charging, that it takes extra time, but the difference between no time and 1.5 seconds is massive. It's the difference between blowing up all your stuff and not blowing up all your stuff. So we're like, all right, 600 ohm resistor, we can do that. Um, and now you have your resistance and you take your maximum system voltage of 400 volts and, you know, you V squared over R for power dissipated by the resistor. And they got 171 Watts for us. Rats. Bro, is this what I get for using a standard calculator? There we go. 266 watts. So we'd probably want to get like a 300 watt resistor or something. So they went for, okay. So a lot of this depends on your data sheet values. So a lot of times they have like a, a constant like power dissipation value that they give you. Like we can dissipate 50 watts continuously. Um, and it's able to handle 250 watts for five seconds. Now, this is acceptable because if you remember, our pre-charge time is one and a half seconds. So five seconds is more than double and there it's more than triple. And therefore it's like, it's pretty adequate. Do they, okay. They don't specify um, anything about the pre-charge resistor in the rules. So we are okay there. So they selected this 50 watt wire wound resistor. So I think this goes to show that looking through the data sheet is probably very, very important and considering things like constant current versus like short term burst is really important. You really only think about it when you're talking about batteries and stuff, but even for any sort of power, anytime you're thinking about power dissipation, then this is a, like a, these are parameters that you want to look at, but cool. So let's say we got a 600 ohm, 50 watt resistor handle for rated for 250 Watts. Now for our case, for a new car, we'll have to select a new resistor because since our maximum battery voltage is 400 volts rather than 320, we hit something like 266 watts. Um, so this would probably be cutting it pretty close. So I'd probably select a new resistor, which one of y'all can do if you want. Um, so now we've got a resistor, right? We figured out, we basically went off of their, whatchamacallit, we went off of their uh, recommendation as to what we what resistor value we use. And this is important because actually, okay, so let's talk about this. Remember we calculated three times the time constant to charge your battery up to 90, 95%, right? Yep. Now, why is that important? Because there are two ways of controlling your AIRs. So if we scroll back up to this circuit right here, then Ooh, how does this work? What, what, what does this do? So when we are, when we first start up the car, you turn on the low voltage system and then you want to turn on the high voltage system. So you go through the shutdown circuit, close all those switches, make sure you don't have any faults. Then what you want to do is you want your main accumulator isolation relay. That's what an AIR is. They're huge, big, chunky relays that can pass 200, 400, 500 amps through their contacts. We want the main positive AIR to be open 
and we want to close this, right? So then when we're starting up our system, we're pre-charging. And then after we deem it, you know, after we, we are like, okay, we're done pre-charging. How do we know we're done pre-charging? You can either measure the voltage of your tractive system or you can time it. You can just say, you can have a IC that's like, all right, wait three seconds and then uh, wait three seconds, then close this and open this. So that's, that also leads us to two different ways of controlling, you know, when you switch over from your like pre-charge configuration to like closing your, opening your pre-charge relay and closing your um, main AIR, your plus AIR. Now you can do that with the timing IC, like I mentioned, you can also do it by measuring voltage. Ideally, you would want to do both. I think originally the plan was to use a timing IC because there's like, you don't have to worry as much about like passing wires through. Um, now I can see why you would want to do voltage control, like, you know, have your microcontroller measuring voltage. Uh, this would be our BMS microcontroller, but measuring voltage and being like, all right, what's, um, we won't, we won't open the pre-charge relay and close this plus AIR until we've hit maximum voltage because it's always possible that something goes wrong and pre-charging doesn't work. That could be dangerous. So this is a, a pretty you know common design, design decision that you'll run into. It's like, how do we want to do it? There's two ways of doing it. Both work, both have their positives and negatives. So we'll have to look at all the pros and cons of doing a timing-based solution versus voltage feedback. What happens if the pre-charge circuit stays closed? Sorry? What happens if the pre-charge circuit stays closed? Like if so both it, AIR is closed, does it matter? Um, if the pre-charge circuit stays closed while the AIRs are closed, is that what you're saying? No, like if, if, if instead of for, for whatever reason, if the pre-charge circuit just doesn't deactivate. Right. Okay, so let's say our pre-charge circuit doesn't deactivate and our... So first, first situation is that um, this is closed and this is closed. You can get away with that because um, because most of your current would still pass through your positive AIR. It would be kind of it would yeah. Most of your current should be passing through your positive AIR if both are closed because this is this would act like a short circuit, whereas this has a six hundred ohm resistance. Now, if our pre-charge, um, if our pre-charge relay stays closed, it stays closed and our AIR stays open, then, oh, let me think. So we would get to 95% of our tractive system voltage, right? But we wouldn't have hit 400 volts. Now I'm trying to think about this because it's possible that you can set something in your inverter where if your voltage dips below a certain amount, then it'll throw a fault and you won't be able to, you know, your shutdown circuit will open because you'll have an inverter fault. Um, but let's see, 0.95 times 403, it's 382. Um, divided by, we have 70, 84, divided by 84. Hold up. Um, that's a good question. I think it depends on how low, um, you're, you're allowing your, you would allow your cells to dip because a lot of these thresholds are gonna be dependent on your batteries, right? So you'll set all of these minimum voltage thresholds in your BMS, you'll set them in your inverter in order to see what that is. So that's, you, it, it, hmm, that's a good question. I gotta work through that a little bit more. Now it could end up in a poor situation um, if our inverter doesn't realize that, or if we miss, if we don't set our 
limits properly and it still tries to draw 200 amps, that could be bad. But there should be, I think we probably will have a wire or some sense wires going to all the AARs and pre-charge relays that should be able to tell us if they have indeed closed. So yeah, no, I'll have to flesh that out. I'll make a note of it. Good question. Doesn't open and plus AR doesn't close. Good question. I gotta think about that. Um, cool. So now we basically have picked out our relay and that's, oh, and the rest of this is about driving the relay. So we, um, with a lot of these, with a lot of these bigger relays and stuff, you, you might think that you just connect the positive lead to, you know, it's shutdown circuit and you just connect the ground to, um, what do you call it? Connect the ground to your microcontroller or whatever, but you generally don't want to do that. You don't want to drive um, a relay directly off of a, like a microcontroller IO like pin just because of you'll have you have you have to check what the um the power consumption of the relay is because relays have power consumptions themselves right when you're running when you're running a current through the coil that controls whether the relay is open or closed you're consuming power there right so usually what you do is you have an external circuit with a transistor so you drive you control the transistor with uh sorry what's up Cool. Um, so you control the transistor with your microcontroller, and that transistor is what, you know, switches the, the usually the ground for your relay. And I think that's what they go on to talk about here. Okay. So I'll add that note into relay driver circuit. There's an internal one built into the um, inverter, but I don't think we generally want to use that because it limits um, your control over that relay and what you can do with it. Um, cool. I guess we can talk about the discharge circuit, but it's kind of the same deal, except a little bit different. So when I go back over the... Um, I think I only went over the T-cell board last time, but I think I'll do another bit covering discharge and the TSMPs. So that's how pre-charging works and why we need it. Why we need it so capacitors in the inverter don't go boom. How does it work? We use a relay to switch a resistor in series with the um, battery and the inverter. Any questions there? Cool. Uh, I need to flush out that section. I kind of threw it on as an afterthought because I remember during the DC DC converter, you're like, oh, shoot. Okay. Not happening. Nice. Um,